Today is Sunday, May 19th, 2019, the fifth Sunday of Easter. Throughout the Easter season, we have to remind ourselves that as Christians, we are a people of hope, and it's that hope that we need to be sharing with the world. All right, so I'm ready to begin yet another Sunday. I'll keep you in prayer. Maybe yesterday's topic was a little bit unfair. Anytime you talk about confirmation, as I said, for many people, it's just a sacrament searching for meaning. Today, I think it's good that we talk about baptism. Certainly, we do read in the Acts of the Apostles of the numerous baptisms that took place in the early church. We're told that St. Peter, in one day, baptized 3,000. Now, I'm sure he had a little bit of help, but still, 3,000. And I do sometimes joke, who was it that did all the paperwork for St. Peter when he baptized 3,000? If you read the Acts of the Apostles, you see the Apostles talking about salvation. Salvation is linked to baptism, for without baptism, who can be saved? Most Catholics don't remember their own baptism because they were probably baptized as an infant. And the Catholic Church is pretty specific today. For baptism to be valid, it requires water, and the invocation of the Holy Trinity. Yes, good morning, Father. How are you? I'm good. To bless this water he has created, which will be sprinkled on us as a memorial of our baptism. May he... Baptism requires that somebody take some water, pour it over the head, or immerse someone in it, and each time, one, two, and three, you say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, I know what they did many years ago. They used to completely submerge the child into the water. I don't believe they still do that right now. It's just they kind of pour the water, the holy water, over the child's head three times, like once for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Pour holy water into the person? I... Baptism. What is it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't put this. <laughs> um, you can be baptized like the normal way with like a priest and stuff. Baptism is where you get water from this kind of thing, and then you do the you do the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yeah. That is the prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That is a form we use and other prayers also. In justice to the person being baptized, it is our responsibility to make sure that the correct formula is used and that those who are involved in the baptism are basically proper candidates and proper sponsors. I tried to explain it in terms of justice. If a person is coming to us freely and without reservation, it is up to us to make sure that everything that we give them meets the standards as God has outlined. With water in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? The mandate to baptize came from Jesus Christ himself, and he gave us the formula. If you recall, he says right in the Gospel of Matthew, go therefore and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so that makes it our responsibility as pastors and shepherds to make sure that that mandate is fulfilled. Now what about all that other stuff that seems to have crept in. Things like the requirements for being a sponsor. I mean, is there a lost passage of scripture where Jesus said, go baptize in the, Father, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and make sure you document everything? And did Jesus give us a list of requirements for what it means to be a sponsor? And of course, as you would guess, the answer is no. However, we have another aspect of Catholicism that we call tradition. The problem is, let's face it, with our fallen nature, there have been liars and scoundrels in the church down through the centuries, and so it's our responsibility to verify that people, what people have said is accurate. Well, when it comes to a godparent, especially someone who is sponsoring somebody, we ask that they be a fully initiated Christian themselves, so we need to verify that. We ask that they be a practicing Christian. That's a little harder to verify. But over the centuries, we've come to realize that it is important to have someone involved in the life of the newly baptized as someone who will help them to grow in the faith. And the simple reason that we have rules for godparents but not for parents is that parents happen because they become parents, 
but godparents are chosen. And so if you're going to choose somebody, we can basically give you the requirements of the type of person we would like to see chosen. You may be asking yourself in your head right now, there are lots of people in this world who are not baptized. What about them? And the first thing I'll say is, why aren't they baptized? Connected to the mandate that Jesus gave was a mandate also to instruct, to evangelize. And so if there are unbaptized people, it's probably because we're not doing our part. Now, of course, that being said, there are people who may never hear the gospel. That is entirely possible. And so that's why the church will also speak about the three forms of baptism. So with the three types of baptism, we've already discussed the first, baptism with water and the Trinity. But there's also then the baptism of desire. You're going to have to come back to me on that one. <laughs> I guess it depends, right? Because if you're a newborn baby and you die and you didn't get the chance of baptism, I think there's called a baptism of, um, like, desire. There's the regular one, the emergency one. There is the baptism by uh, desire. And, and especially in the era of the martyrs we know about, there was a baptism by blood. But there's really no clear answer. That's really a God question, because I have no idea who, what happens exactly. And there's the baptism by martyrdom, so... Um... The three forms of baptism, then, are baptism with water, which I highly encourage everybody to pursue, a baptism of desire, and baptism by blood. Now, more importantly, I think we need to speak of why baptism, what are the effects of baptism, and at the top of the list, of course, the salvation of the soul, is through the forgiveness of sins. Uh, through our baptism, we are uh, dying for our original sin and our, all the nature of sins. And uh, we will be uh, resurrected from, with Jesus Christ. And we are having a new life. Which we are brought into the family of God. We are relieved of our original sin. So it is possible for us to enjoy happiness forever with God. Now, the most fundamental reason for baptism is that it incorporates us. It welcomes us into the mystical body of Christ. In fact, we refer to baptism as a gateway sacrament. It's the gateway to all the other sacraments. Baptism is when you first are welcomed into the Catholic Church, like you are officially part of the Catholic Church. It's just the first sacrament that a lot of people receive. Stuff like kind of their initiation into the church. You know, you're welcomed into the Catholic Church. Okay. Basically, baptism is the initial sacrament through which one is admitted in the church. That means church is the mystical body of Jesus Christ. So in the sacrament of baptism, when someone is baptized, there is an indelible mark put on their soul configuring them to Jesus Christ, incorporating them into the body of Christ. Sunday, um, what do you mean by the other? At the beginning of Mass, you're like, peace be with you. You say that to the congregation, but then we say, with your spirit. Why are we saying, with your spirit? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Et cum spirito tuo, and with your spirit. It's not necessarily being wished to me, but the spirit that has been granted me as a priest. At, in, at their work and says, uh, you know, you can't, have that there and they're like well this is my private desk this is my private office I'm not you know if I see a client it's not facing them it's facing me why is this a problem um, you know that's an example of a kind of a persecution that we would find in this country here today we don't have to go to the other side of the world to do it we don't have to get our heads blown off to be persecuted we can just be peer pressured and oppressed in our everyday practices of worship in the secular environments that we find ourselves in